Kaplan. Take it away, Otto. Thank you. Thank you very much, Panyabasa. Hello, Navakavatans. Otto Excelsior here and uh, Navakavata.org. And uh, we're here with uh, Panyabasa once more. Um, talking uh, as part of our series of nuts and bolts Buddhism, or just basically um, the idea of talking about uh, Buddhist ideas uh, that uh, people just beginning to approach Buddhism uh, might find of interest. And one of the things I've been asked about by more than one person, um, people who've been become very interested in Buddhism lately, and uh, they're they're women, and uh, they're interested in um, whether there's anything gender specific to Buddhism. And whether there's any kind of a special uh, feminine or female way in Buddhism. Uh, so uh, I thought we'd uh, talk a little bit about that. Now, Penny Basa, could you tell us a little bit about the, the history of women in, in Buddhism? Now, originally there were bhikkhus, um, what we call monks, but it was uh, later on that uh, bhikkhunis or nuns were uh, were established. Yeah, I can tell you like the uh, Orthodox tradition, for starters, and then. I mean, if you like, we can discuss how likely the Orthodox tradition is to be historically accurate. Right. But the Orthodox tradition is that at first there were only monks, and the Buddha's stepmother and aunt, because his father married two sisters, his own mother died, but his his mother's sister was also married to his father, so she raised him. And uh, her name was Mahapajapati Gotami, and she wanted to become a nun. And every time she'd go to the Buddha and ask, he'd say, "Don't even, don't even bring it up. It's mm. not a good idea. We're not going to do that." And so eventually, she just, she just started following him around with dust in her hair, and you know, dust on her garments, and tears on her face, and would just stand outside his doorway crying. And so, the Buddha's cousin Ananda, who was also his attendant. And so he was, he's a member of the family also. He, uh, he started remonstrating with the Buddha. And finally, he got the point across, or he, he persuaded the Buddha to allow nuns to be ordained, mainly with the point that the Buddha had to agree that women are just as capable of becoming enlightened as men are. And so he had to agree to that. And he said, all right, but now you've done it. Because, <laughs> because of allowing nuns, B true Buddhism, the Sadama, will survive for only 500 years. Hmm. Would have lasted a thousand years, which is kind of a strange, controversial statement, not just because it's politically incorrect, but because the Buddha is saying that Buddhism, true Buddhism, would survive for only 500 years. And here we are 2,500 years later. In fact, by the time the commentaries were written um, in Sri Lanka, it was already about a thousand years. Wow. So the Buddha Gosa, the main uh, Theravada Buddhist commentator, he was, I mean, he, he was really backed against the wall. You know, it's like, you can't say the Buddha was wrong. <laughs> no. You can't say, you know, he misspoke or, you know, he can't walk back what the Buddha said, like the White House does to, to President Biden, you know. Right. So right. he's saying, well, what he said was 500, but what he meant was 5,000 years ah. so we're still only halfway through according to the uh, in, uh the medieval commentaries but um yeah it was that was how the 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 bhikkhuni sangha or the order of nuns began was by the buddha ordaining his own stepmother mahapajapati Gotami as the first nun and part of the they had to make really sure that only women who really had a spiritual calling would be ordained as nuns because in ancient India, as is often the case still in modern India, women would be married to someone they'd never even met until their wedding day. And they might get stuck in a really horrible marriage. Uh, and so yeah. they might want to ordain as nuns just to get away from some asshole. Right. So they made the rules stricter and more difficult for nuns in most respects. They're, in some ways, the nuns have it easier, but they've, like, there are four Parajika rules for monks. They're the most important rules. If you break any of these, you're excommunicated for life and you cannot be ordained as a monk ever again. For the bhikkhunis, there are eight instead of four. Oh. And then also there are the, the Garu Dhamma or the, it's like the, <clears throat> I'm not sure how Garu Dhamma would uh, translate in English. Garu is like serious or heavy. You know, it's right. like 
the important rules. And one of those is that even the most senior nun still has to bow down to even the most junior monk. Yeah. Like every monk ranks higher than any nun. Wow. This was largely an ancient Indian cultural thing. You know, right. if the were alive today, things might be different because women weren't, aren't essentially owned by a man, right. you know, by their father, then by their husband, then by their sons. Right, right. Like was in ancient India and to some degree even modern India. So to some degree that was just a, a way of ensuring that uh, only the really serious women that really have a spiritual calling would right. even want to be ordained. And that's one reason why the Bikuni Sangha died out is that it was – to some degree, it was too too strict. You know, women weren't women had stricter rules than than the men did, and so it just caused you know fewer women to want to be ordained. And also, there was one rule that nuns weren't allowed to live in the forest, and that was just for their own safety because they were bandits, oh. and you know, bandits often are kind of rapey. You know, oh yeah, so yeah. There was a rule that nuns were not allowed to live in the forest so that during times when you had some Hindu king that was persecuting Buddhists, the nuns were easier to eradicate than the monks were. Right. So that's another reason why the Bhikkhuni Sangha died out hundreds of years ago, although there have been attempts recently to revive that. Now, um, first thing that occurs to me when you were saying that, um, you were, gave, of course, the traditional orthodox um, uh, story of how how the uh, the uh, Bikuni order was founded, and it seems to me, leave, leaving aside the the ambiguity of those numbers that the Buddha was uh, tossing about, um, it <clears throat> with all due respect to, to it, um, it seems to me that this is also serves as a very effective foundation myth, in the sense of the women that are going to follow this, they have to really want to, as you point out, it's very important to screen them carefully. And the story is, you know, please, 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 you have to be not only begging the Buddha really hard, but actually be a relative before he finally. So it's, it's um, to me, very natural that if you, if you wanted to create an order that's as, like you say, that you need to, um, you want to make it diff as difficult for people to join as possible because you want to screen out people who would otherwise be failing in their function in society. You know, uh, uh, someone who's taking these vows should be doing so from a sense of religious vocation, not a, as a way of destabilizing the culture, whatever you think of it. You know, you, you can't have religions running around that destabilize the, the social institution. So, um, but the, that, that number two is, is, is very odd. Is there any chance that um, the number was miswritten, a zero left off. I don't understand. I don't know the, the numeration. I'm used to the um, the uh, Arab Arab numbers uh, with the zeros, you know, knots. But was there some way that uh, some easy way you could explain it away as a, just a translation or a, a copyist error? Well, they didn't use numerical digits. So uh, oh. like the word for 100 in Pali would be sata and the word for 1000 would be sahasa. I'm pretty sure I'm rusty in my poly. Right. Pretty right. Sure. Greg. So, um, yeah, it would have had to have been some kind of wild misprint. And, uh, I mean, there's a good chance that it is apocryphal. It may be that the whole bhikkhunis dating all the way back to the Buddha may be apocryphal for all I know, because there's clearly some ambiguity. Like it was like some of, some of the monks were in favor and some of the monks weren't. And so that, that may be how the story got, developed of the buddha allowing them but very reluctantly that kind of thing and making the rules stricter for them i mean it may be partly uh, as a way of appeasing like the don't let them in faction in the ah world. yeah yeah uh, and at the same time providing providing a foundation myth that reflects all this and it's i mean it's people can accuse the early song of sexism or whatever but i mean that was First of all, that was just standard in ancient India. There were, I think there were female Jains. Um, yeah, some, some groups did not allow women. And mainly, I mean, it wasn't that women were inferior, like the Buddha himself admitted that women are you know, just as capable of becoming enlightened as men. It's just that men and women together make problems, especially if they are celibate. You know, yes. celibate men and women interacting with each other when there's this tension. Celibacy is not necessarily easy. Yeah, and right. it's always, you know, it's that he saw as like the main problem with not only with monks and nuns, but with monks and, and female humans in general. Right. There's supposed to be very limited interaction. 
Right. Well, yeah, there are, you know, we are, uh, as you pointed out, others have pointed out, we, we are biological entities um, and our bodies function in certain ways. And uh, men and women will, uh, even on an unconscious level, begin to communicate through pheromones, through electro, I, I believe, bioelectrical fields. Um, and through subtleties of body language that you're completely unaware of. So when you're trying to, you know, n you're trying to avoid sensuality, obviously, if you're with someone of the opposite sex, no matter under, under what circumstances, if you're there personally, there are ways of communicating and interacting on a completely nonverbal, even nonvisual level. So I could, I could see why he would, uh, would worry about that. Um, yeah, the woman's breasts are communicating to men constantly whenever they are visible well um tits or gtfo right this is uh, <laughs> reflected in the internet and uh this is something i've had discussions about um and my my take on that whole thing there are no girls on the internet which means the on the internet? that there and there are no boys on the internet for that matter um we're never in personal contact um most 99 percent of interaction on the internet is people reading something someone else typed on a screen we're all basically pen pals speed it up 10 million times oh, enemies. Uh, so so there's no no physical interaction there's no chance for pheromones to interact no one has to be male or female you can't really flirt online it's just kind of like a, a sort of um extended sort of pornography if you like very softcore perhaps but I mean, and I'm not putting down any kind of polite flirtation as a social lubricant, har har. Um, I'm just saying that there is a level of communication on the internet which precludes that tension unless people want to artificially make it for themselves. And I think it, it does help men and women to communicate um, more easily and more honestly with each other and appreciate each other better in some ways. Um, but there's also that whole um, idea that in order to learn something, you need to have a personal communication with the teacher. So, you know, you would, you would, um, I'm just thinking of the bikunis. You couldn't take bikunis and just separate them from the, the male sangha uh, electronically in order to, uh, Technically? yeah, that's, that'd be a way you could have, uh, if you were going to try to create bikunis today. Yeah. Okay. You know, they, because that didn't there have to be like a monk would give like a Dhamma talk. To yeah. With every Uposita day, which is, um, at the very least, the uh, full moon day and the new moon day, like when the monks are doing what is called the Padimoka re recitation, you know, they're doing the Uposita ceremony. Um, they're supposed to be, it's a rule for the, the nuns to send a nun to first inquire what day the Uposita day will be and to request a monk come in and deliver a sermon. So, and there's, that was like one of the duties for monks in ancient times, if there were any nuns around is before Uposita, a senior monk would be chosen to go and, and give a, a sermon or dharma, dharma talk to the nuns. And then the rules are so strict that uh, the nuns weren't even allowed to sit down in the presence of a monk, so they'd have to remain standing. Although the devas do the same thing, which is kind of interesting. Like when gods, small g gods, would come to visit the Buddha, they would always remain standing. They wouldn't sit down. Hmm. No, the um, wasn't that also the custom of kings as well? Yeah, it may be that kings just didn't want to humble themselves by sitting down. I'm not sure about that one. I don't know. Perhaps the Davis had the same same motivation. Yeah, I mean, when I was a monk, I met with a few high-ranking, you know, lay dignitaries, and uh, they would sit on an equal height seat with me. You know, they wouldn't sit on a higher seat, but they didn't That's want something. to sit either. So we just sit on the same the same height of seat. Huh. Reminds me of uh, something they say, if you go to a town, you see that uh, at one time, what was the tallest building was the church. Then the next tallest, next building that would be built taller than it would be city hall. And then the next building built taller than that would of course be the bank. And uh, just goes to show uh, something to do with height. And anything. But um, so I, I wanted to ask you too about um, the Bakunis. Now, when, when were, when did the Bakuni order become extinct? Do we under do we know the circumstances? Do we know you know who was the last of the Bakunis or where their last nunnery was? They gradually faded out, and I've seen the number passed around that it, they died out about a thousand years ago in Sri Lanka or some such place. But then again, I've looked at old Burmese chronicles, like back to the 15 or 1600s, and there was still mention of Bakunis then. So okay. at least in Burma. They, they lived up, they were up until like the, the 16th or maybe even 17th century. 
And then they finally just died out. Although they still have nuns. Like in Thailand and, and Burma, probably, I assume Sri Lanka also, there are still nuns. It's just that they usually keep 10 precepts. And, uh, you know, it, it works better. They don't get the same um, respect as the monks do, but even the fully ordained bhikkhunis didn't get the same respect as the monks right. in, in traditional Asia anyway. So it, it, it tend to work better because uh, most Asian monks um they they really don't even try to follow all the rules so i mean you've mentioned that before yeah the sloppy monks if you've only got 10 rules to break that's better than having 3,000 rules to break right right very much so yeah 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 that was actually going to be my next question about the nuns now uh when you say nuns obviously you're not translating the word bhikkhuni uh what what's the the poly term for what they do just people that take 10 precepts or well um They'd use like a vernacular of whatever country they're in. Like in Burma, they're called Tilashin, which means like uh, master of morality or, you know, oh, okay. thing like that. Like a possessor of morals or moral virtue. And that's oh, okay. I can't remember what they're called in, uh, in Thailand. But um, so everyone knows they're not bhikkhunis, but they and they're granted a certain amount of respect for what they've done now. Uh, what kind of women tend to uh, take this course? And how permanent is it? Is it as impermanent as a lot of uh, Asian uh, male monks that I've heard of? Well, I assume that it's, I mean, there are a few that really are just, you know, out trying to become enlightened, although they are the minority, just as monks trying to become enlightened are the minority for, for traditional Asian male Buddhist monastics. Um, uh, sorry to say, but I think most of them are just like old maids who, uh, you know, they, they couldn't get themselves a good husband, and so, you know, they just turned to religion, which I think is probably the case in uh, early Christianity and maybe medieval Christianity. Hmm. Well, these uh, orders often function as a, in a sense of social safety net, you know, for people that don't have sufficient family. And uh, haven't you mentioned, too, that occasionally uh, older men in uh, Burma would become monks simply because it was a way to retire almost? Yeah, yeah, it was a lot of a lot of Burmese men when they when they retire just enter a monastery. Yeah, yeah. And um, I, I mean, Theravada Buddhism is kind of strange with regard to like gender issues, partly because I mean it may be at present the most masculine spiritual system in existence. It was made by men for men. And not only was it made for men, but it was tough ascetic men that avoided women as much as possible. Right. But there was almost no feminine uh, element. In, right. in fact, most of the, the suttas about nuns in the text were probably composed by men and just made up just uh, for ed edifying, you know, the purposes of edification or whatever. But on the other hand, most... Um, most really devout religious Buddhists in in Asia are women, and it's um, like they're the ones who feed the monks. Like if you've seen any of the old videos of me going for all, yeah. it's just this line of women and girls. I you noticed know, that. Yeah, might be a guy, but it's almost all women who support the monks. And it was that way from the beginning. Like there mm. are rules for monks when they go for alms. You take your bull and you walk to the village. And it says, you, you know, you stop in front of the house and if she gets up from her work and goes into the kitchen or if she starts wiping off a bowl or a spoon, <laughs> then you wait a little longer because it looks like she might give you something. And that's, that's they use the, the feminine pronoun when they're giving instructions, wow. you know, monks on, you know, how to properly go for alms. You know, you don't want to wait too long and embarrass anybody. But if she, okay. gets yeah. up and, you know, starts uh, cleaning a bowl or something, then you can wait longer. <laughs> So it's it's uh, kind of a strange situation in that uh, women, um, really of, of the devout believing Buddhists, women are probably the majority. Even though you know the monks is is a, it's a guy thing. There's not a ne not nearly as many nuns as there are monks, and it, it's just a very head oriented system, which may appeal to Western women a little more even, but right. because. I mean, Buddhism is just really just a head-oriented system. Although you can say that there's like a more feminine approach to Dhamma and a more masculine approach, you know, more more heart-oriented, you know, quote-unquote, versus more head-oriented. 
like in Buddhism, um, there's two ways of defining enlightenment. One is the end of suffering, which is kind of a heart, compassionate, heart oriented approach. And then there's just the end of delusion, which is more of a head oriented approach. Although ultimately it's, ultimately it's the same enlightenment. If you get rid of one, you get rid of the other. Right, right. Yeah. No, well, um, one of, that's always sort of uh, one of the things that always struck me about Buddhism is that um, it was created by a man who was a hardcore forest ascetic. Um, this was a guy who was one of the top, you know, people in a land where asceticism was being practiced probably by more people than at any other time of history. And uh, when he um, found enlightenment and started talking to it was the five brethren, I think he first talked to about this. These, again, were guys, these were all men who had lived in the forest for a long time. They came from, as you say, a background of strict asceticism. There were no women involved. And um, he really wasn't trying to create something that would be acceptable to all levels of society. It was, as you say, by a man, for men, and not just any men but men who had dedicated themselves to this incredibly strict, men who are freer than probably any of us uh, will ever be because they had conquered the things that would enslave them, you know, their desires, their, their clinging, and, and the things that, that really, really enslave us, are the things that are within our, ourselves, our defilements. Um, so it's, that's why it's always kind of, and you've heard me say, talk about this, I, I compare Buddhism in that sense to sort of rock and roll, which is also a very male-oriented uh sort of an activity and there are women that are very comfortable in rock and roll i've seen women come backstage and they really enjoy it and they're cool with it but there are also women that simply will melt in the rock and roll environment or insist that it be changed that certain words not be said that's who's why would you wear that t-shirt um women like this just they they don't really fit in very well and i would imagine it's the same thing with any spiritual path i think there are some women uh, with whom buddhism can really resonate um but not with many, and as you say, there, you said there, there's always, there, there have always been fewer bhikkhunis than bhikkhus, even when there were bhikkhunis, and I think to this day fewer women who are really serious about Buddhism um, than men, at least, you know, actual Buddhism. Yeah, and getting back to rock and roll, a band that has a female in it, usually the vocalist, I mean, it has a much higher likelihood of breaking up because inevitably she's going to start sleeping with one of the guys and... Yeah. It's rock and roll after all, you know. Or in an all girls band, and they generally don't last very long either because just due to differences in human nature, women don't make like long term bonds with other women the way men make long term bonds with other men because in the Stone Age, you know, they're having to, their lives depend on each other. They're going out hunting, yeah. whatever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's that too. But getting back to the asceticism part, that's. One thing I've noticed about, um, you know, just feminine human nature in general is they're not nearly as ascetic as men are. Comfort is more important to women than it is to men as a general rule. Mm. And I've noticed that with regard to, like, very obviously effeminate monks, like homosexuals, who in Asia, they can be ordained as as monks as a socially acceptable way of not getting married, you know. Because they just don't like girls very much, you know. Right. They also stay away from the rough forest monasteries and usually just stay at the comfy meditation centers in town. Right. There's that too. But I mean, if you're at, if you're a lay person, you know, you're not just going out into a forest, sitting under a tree, being bitten by mosquitoes and flies, because you're not even allowed to swat them. Then, um, yeah, just living a household life it, it works really well for women. You know, they meditate probably more than most laymen meditate. And, you know, they're the ones who are offering the food to the to the monks in the morning. And they're the ones sitting in front of the, the altar work, running their rosaries. And, yeah, they're just, uh, they, they're more religious than men. Possibly, uh, I mean, it's, it's that way with possibly all religions, except for maybe like things like Mithraism that just didn't let them in. Right. Uh, you know, women. Um, this person did a lot, a lot of people, and they were a little selective. They were on the selective yeah. side. Probably yeah. why they're not around I, now. I can't remember if it's in the Dhammapada, but it says that, you know people turn to religion out of fear. And, yeah, I remember that one. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like um, just due to differences in human nature, women are more likely to 
want to be religious just for the sake of you know being sure that they're not going to go to hell or or whatever or they want well, good karma and not bad karma that sort of thing and, and getting back to you know uh, evolutionary forces it, comfort is important to women because the women are taking care of the children the men are out there stubbing their toes and cutting their fingers on their their flint tip spears bringing in food bonding because you need to be able to bond with your hunting mates Whereas the women have to be very sensitive to temperature changes. So what, is the fire getting low? The baby will freeze sort of thing. And yeah. it also strikes me, and this is something I remember long ago we were talking about this, and you brought up that um, uh, sort of the metaphor of Buddhism is sort of like an Apollo moonshot. You've got the monks who are like the, the astronauts sitting in the top, but then you've got the rest of the society is like the support system. So you need the lay community, I mean, to put the food into those bowls. Monks can't, you know... Uh, go out and hunt, but they certainly can eat the result of that hunting. So we, while while as a monk, uh, a monk can't say you should go out and kill that deer, advocate that certainly he can consume that part. I'm sure the Buddha was aware of this. I don't think there's any hypocrisy involved. It's simply the fact that you know you you need the entire community to support this moon rocket, and hopefully you'll get people off to uh, you know. I'm, I'm mixing a metaphor now. We're launching a missile across across to the other shore. That's I don't know if that's a very Pacific kind of, but you, you know what I mean. Yeah, I mean, at least you need enough people to support the monks that the monks can go for it. Yeah, the, the usual example I give is like a um, mountain climbing expedition where you've got to have the base camp that's supporting the guys who are trying to make it to the very top. So women are, in a sense, this base camp not only... Um, biologically, traditionally, with, you know, taking care of the family while the men are out, but also uh, are the support system uh, for the Sangha in a certain sense while Good. and reach the next world. Hey, we lost. Are you there? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. You look a little bit frozen. I was for a moment and there was, I guess we, we said something to blow the NSA's mind or something. I guess. Are yeah. we still recording? Did that? Uh... Yeah, I, yeah, we're still recording. Okay. Okay. Yeah, they already messed up my camera, so I'm using the default one on the laptop, just in case anyone's wondering about the crappy quality of the uh, video. I oh, thought, I thought you were doing it as, as an ascetic practice. Yeah, but again, it's like women are the supporters of the Sangha, mainly. Men are mostly the Sangha. Women are supporters of the Sangha, traditionally. But then you get into the postmodern West, and that's not going to fly at all. It, that's sexist and wrong, and so it's got to be changed. But uh, any layperson, though, can practice mindfulness or meditate if they want, but they, yeah, you know... It's... nobody's stopping them, unless yeah. it's their own, like, obligations to their family or job or whatever. Right. You know, you, you have to work around that. And if, you, if you're if you so motivated to, you know, to practice that you can, you know, push these things aside, well, then, yeah, perhaps you'd want to, you know, uh, join the Sangha or at least, you know, up your precepts, you know, kick them up a notch. But, yeah. Um, yeah, so so I see um, women as having an important spiritual place, and um, I could see, you know, again, as a kind of seeing how their support of the sangha could be a basis for a, a female spiritual practice if they wanted to, you know, push that further. Just that whole caring thing and and the, the whole virtue of of uh, supporting the dhamma that way. It tends to be seen as utterly demeaning to feminists, however. That's very odd. Yeah. Like a lot of what's coming out today seems very, I feel like an old man in my day. I never thought I'd be old enough to say in my day, but uh, in my day, we didn't behave like that. All change is obviously for the worse. I think so anyway, sometimes. But, yeah, well, most of it is. Yeah. Oh, so today, uh, a, a woman who's uh, looking towards uh, Buddhism as a spiritual path Um is in danger of uh, following down some some false avenues, I think, that are being promulgated, places like Spirit Rock. Yeah, yeah, anyone who goes to any of those ultra-liberal Buddhist groups is going to be exposed to more, you know, political correctness, indoctrination, and cultural Marxism, and climate change hysteria, and so forth, than actual Dharma. So, yeah. like with men, I mean, as a general rule, your first recourse in many cases, your best recourse is just books on the internet as a way of just obtaining objective information rather than running it through the filter of, you know, social justice or whatever. Right. Do some thinking for yourself. Yeah. Well, and even if you look for it on the internet, I mean, your best bet is to read translations, reliable 
translations of the Buddhist texts themselves rather than, you know, on a reading Lion's Roar magazine or something, which is, <laughs> you know, it's just all this, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion stuff masquerading <laughs> Buddhism. Uh, now, um, we've been going on for a bit. Um, I was wondering if you wanted to talk a little bit. I, I don't know a whole lot about it, but apparently you, meant, you brought it up before that uh, the Bikuni order has apparently been revived or someone there, there's been some movement towards the idea that you could possibly do that. And I don't see how you actually could, because as I understand, you need five existing Bikunis to ordain a Bikuni, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's why. So. Like when I was in Burma, like at the Uposada ceremony every new moon day and full moon day, you know, the monks are supposed to admonish the bhikkhunis, you know, choose a monk to go and give the Dhamma talk. And we just say, you know, there are no bhikkhunis. You know, they're gone. There aren't any more. Right. And, and officially, I mean, technically, the reason is that once they die out, it would take some kind of great council where they would have to be reestablished through this formal act of the Sangha of the Four Quarters, which would be so non-traditional and non-conservative that most of the senior monks who participate in these things wouldn't even think of it. Right. So uh, I guess back in the 1970s, some Sri Lankan monks who really don't care much about Winia, um, they just went ahead and started <laughs> dating nuns. And then um, there's a, a famous... Theravada Buddhist monk in Australia, Ajahn Brahm, who uh, he just took the authority of the Buddha upon himself and just declared that monks are good enough to ordain the first nuns. And then you've got this theory that uh, even like a monk that I respect, uh, Venerable Ajahn Punadamo, I've been doing some videos with him over the past couple months, and he was he was giving this theory that I've heard many times before that there were nuns that were like Mahayana nuns that were still following the rules of monastic discipline in, I think it's Taiwan or Korea or something. Wow. And that the lineage remained alive, you know, through these nuns in Taiwan or Korea. Although personally, I consider it very unlikely that they would have been doing the ordination ceremonies correctly and right. well in accordance with the Pali texts right now they're probably at the very least you know they're they're including various traditional things from Taiwan or Korea or whatever doing their their liturgy in Taiwanese or Korean or whatever and yeah I don't think it I don't think it's valid so it's it's mainly um just modern political correctness you know the sake of gender equality which is ironic as hell because as we were saying earlier the the rules are completely like the the cards are stacked against women you know it's they, they don't have equality you know like even the most senior nun is supposed to bow to even the most junior monk a woman no. is a, a nun isn't even allowed to sit down in the presence of a monk although right. a, a one a nun isn't even allowed to sit cross-legged like oh. even alone it's against the rules for her to sit cross-legged so oh. you got to have her legs kind of tucked up to one side the way a lot of Southeast Asian ladies sit. So it's just ridiculous to me that these these new bhikkhunis, they're they're like just force forcing the bhikkhuni sangha, whether it's valid or not, they're just insisting that there gotta be bhikkhunis just, just because of gender equality essentially. And then they just from the very get go, they're not following the rules. Right. Because they're saying, well that's I mean the Buddha couldn't have really said that. I mean that's that's yeah, the, yeah. That, and wrong and the buddha being fully enlightened has <laughs> got to be politically correct by 21st yeah. century standards yeah, yeah, and so yeah. it's just ridiculous that for the yeah. sake of gender equality they're reviving this this organization that is that completely discriminates against women and then they're just rejecting that part instead of just starting a new sangha of new nuns that don't wouldn't be called bikunis but i mean they, they could pick any rules that would be appropriate right they, they can dress as they please they can do as they please so long as they don't call themselves bikunis but it seems like the main point is just getting the official status of bikunis which is i mean official status is one of the things you're supposed to abandon or right announce right when you become a monastic anyway yeah if they if they're really really so serious about you know the practice then they can take as you say take any precepts you want take as many as you like 
live live it. I mean, if you really, to my mind, um, the, like you say, just wanting the official title seems silly. To me, the challenge would be to actually live like a bikuni, follow all of the rules, which yeah. would be very, very difficult. And if you did that, then you'd have then you'd have my respect. Then you'd get people bowing down to you. And even though you couldn't take the title of Bakuni, people would start calling you a Bakuni anyway. That'd be the way to reestablish the Bakuni order through action, not uh, protests. Yeah. But, or and then again, I mean, this. Uh, I mean, you're running the Navakavada channel, and Navakavada is essentially what we were talking about a few years that's ago. True. You just that's start true. a new quasi sangha where the rules and, and everything is appropriate to the West, men and women can be equal. doesn't oh, matter. Certainly. You know, Spiritually, yeah. Endearing an ancient tradition and then just forced fitting this modern, like, feminism and, you know, gender equality and political correctness onto it is just, I mean, it's just destroying an ancient yeah. tradition in the West. Yeah. But I think, though, people people are aware of this, though. Some you people. Know, some people, the important people. I mean, we're talking about it, and there are always going to be, be people who are serious about what they're doing spiritually. Because, you know, I mean, most of these people, these you know, this, this neo-Buddhism, I don't know what else to call it, uh, that you see, and it, it's, it's part of that whole spectrum of new agey thought. Um, it's so spiritually unsatisfying. It's nothing but candy. It's like, you know, I was talking to somebody about it. It's like, oh, this gives you freedom. It's like, well, it's the freedom of a playpen. It's the freedom to say, oh, now I can stay up as late as I want. I can eat nothing but candy. I, can, I don't have to change my diapers ever again. I'm free. I'm free. And it's, it's so, so childish. And I think people eventually get sick of it. And they turn and they want, they want the real message. They want the real, the real Dhamma. And, um, you know, unfortunately, what was it? Uh, my, one of my, my little literary things I was proud of. Most people discover the Dhamma through the Sangha on their way to the Buddha, and if the Sangha is a joke, and, and, and the, the, the Dhamma is, is corruption, then they're not going to find the Buddha. But people, people are, I think, turning to the, to the, to the truth. I think that uh, they're being sickened by, by these, um, these overly sugared um, kind of concepts that are trying to pass off as Buddhism. But, uh, sorry, that's my rant. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, anybody, male or female, all you got to do is just consult the text. There are a lot of good translations out there and just read what it says. And if you like that and want to follow it, then whether you're male or female, I mean, it does seem to, I mean, just the, the nuts and bolts of the, the Buddhist philosophy, because as we were saying earlier, it was developed by men for men who are just tough forest ascetics. Right. It's going to appeal more to men than to women, especially educated like it really appeals to like engineers and chemists and so forth who have like that analytical, you know, organizing kind of mind. And yeah. it's, it's sort of like um, becoming an engineer. I mean, women, they can go to engineering school and be trained as engineers. And but most of them just don't want to. But some do. And, and yeah. they're welcome. And um, no, actually, I was thinking about Buddhism the other day. When, when you think about the. Um, sorry about that. When you, th when you think about what the Buddha went through to find his system, and then not only did he attain enlightenment, but then he was, I, I say this with all due respect, autistic enough to go back in detail every single mental psychological step. As you say, Buddhism is profoundly psychological. The more I look into it, the more I see this. And uh, what kind of a mind? This man was brilliant. I mean, obviously, he was an enlightened being. But to, to take the time to do all this, and I mean, of course, at first he, he considered not not teaching, right? I mean, it was like, hey, I'm here. Well, I don't know anything. I'm, I'm here. See you later. Uh, he just figured nobody would get it. So well, he was yeah, there's that. Like a, an enlightened hermit. And then according to the legend, again, Mahabrahma came down from a high heaven realm and begged him to, to teach a system that would uh, essentially make fun of Mahabrahma. So, hmm. can't believe it. But yeah, I, I uh, agree with you. I mean, men and women have uh, are equal spiritually certainly you know we're all we're all uh what was the old saying we're we're um spirits of of uh, of um nobility no what was it an angel riding an ape that was it Although, yeah like an angel riding a dog there but you go. A dog in addition to the angel it's, you're both really <laughs> uh who was the one that was reincarnated several hundred times as a dog just because he liked being a dog it's actually pretty fun well, some dogs have it pretty good. 
The ones it's in the so West have it pretty good. Yeah. Pretty easy to see how a Southeast Asian village dog is in a lower realm. Yeah, perhaps so. Old dog is an old dog there. Yeah. So well, are we are we done now? Is this is this the end? I, I think so, unless you, you thought we could, uh, anything else you wanted to cover? Well, I, I might as well just throw in, you know, so that, uh, you know, as the Buddha himself freely admitted that men and women are equally capable of becoming enlightened. It's just, although there are differences, and so there's a different different routes you know, women are more heart oriented men are more head oriented you know just using generalities and head and heart are equal although Theravada Buddhism as it exists in the text not as it is being radically mutated in in the modern west but as it exists in the text it's a very head oriented system so it, it is likely to appeal more to the male mind than to the female mind just statistically speaking right right but if anyone really like it and a lot of them do then more power to them i mean if you're just interested in living a good life and being happy there's a lot of that in theravada buddhism also i mean if uh you don't have to you know renounce the world and live under a tree right to be a, a good buddhist Right. And the, the lay people in Burma tend to be better Buddhists than the monks just because they've only got five rules to break and they're really devout and generous and just good people, whereas a lot of the monks are just pretty corrupt, actually. Not necessarily evil people, but just really sloppy monks. Yeah, yeah. Well, well on that, we'll end this here. Thank you very much, Panibasa for being part of our show. I look forward to the next time we can talk. Yeah, me too.